Hello and welcome to all for United. Make sure you hit a like on this video and make sure you also get in the comments and share your tributes and memories of a legend. Today, with the Manchester Munich Memorial Foundation, Tom Clare is back with us as well, as well. Roy Kavanagh, uh, MBEs with us too, authors, historians. We are here to chat about an icon, a hero, a man who is fully in the legacy of Manchester United and helped set the foundations to what we see for our football club today. Usually, I come over to Pat and I say to Pat, please tell us a little bit why we're going to be talking about this person today. But I want to reframe that question because if you don't know, you haven't seen it on the thumbnail, you haven't seen it in the title. Today, we are paying tribute, we're remembering, and we're talking about the man, the legend that is Harry Gregg. Unfortunately, obviously, we lost Harry recently and we've had his family's blessing to talk about him today. Um, there's various people obviously on this panel who are close to his family and, and also at some points have been close to Harry as well. But I want to start this conversation where we left off from the Tommy Taylor one, Pat. And the last thing you said to me on that was that we, when we talk about Harry Gregg, we're going to be talking about the hero of Munich. For fans mm. out there who don't know why that sentiment is true, could you please explain and could you please hit on why it's so important that we're talking about Harry, Harry Gregg today? Well, Harry, Harry Gregg was a signing three months before the Munich air disaster. I think we'd said Tommy Taylor had been a world record at just short of 30,000 by a pound. And the very next signing was Harry, but that was four or five years apart. And at that time, he was the world's best goalkeeper. And we paid a world record fee for him. So there was that bring in your own, but where you've got an exceptional need for a specialist player like Taylor, like Greg, that's where they invested their money. Uh, and Harry had only been with us uh, three months when he went through the nightmare of Munich. And, he, and he's called the hero of Munich. And I remember saying this in, in February after we got back from Munich and sadly Harry passed away, that he would not recognise himself in, in that way. Um, such a humble man, such a modest man. Um, he did not like the title hero. He just saw him and he didn't want it to be his legacy. More importantly, he would always say, I'm Henry Gregg from 34 Windsor Avenue, Coleraine. And at times, I were pretty good at football. That's how he wanted to be remembered. But you see, for us, he is a hero and he is a legend. I remember saying this in an interview I did in February as well. Not just of football, not just of Manchester United, but of humanity. Um, it's a very, very, very rare person indeed who did what he did to actually return to a crashed burning aircraft and pull five, six people out, including Busby, Charlton, Violet, Blanche Flower, Mrs. Lukic, Vera Lukic, who was pregnant at the time, and her daughter, who Harry eventually got to meet many, many years later. It's an exceptional person that does that, but he didn't want that to be his legacy. But, and I was thinking about before before I come on tonight, you know, they say he's a hero, he's a legend, and that is banded about like chicken feed nowadays. It really is. Uh, and I get it. Society moves on. You know, people will be acclaimed for appearing in a reality show and they're a hero. Uh, but he really was a hero. Um, and if you ever got to meet him and you were lucky enough to spend time in his company you weren't disappointed some people you meet and you think well you know your ego is bigger than your head he was completely the opposite he, he was so reserved about it so humble and alongside jimmy and this is what we, we you were talking about alongside jimmy and billy fowkes and bobby charlton he was instrumental in samat being able and jimmy to bring in our club out of its darkest days and then a decade later return to the pinnacle of where they'd almost got to. He was that important to us. Um, the man is loved, he's revered. And, um, you know, I'm just so grateful that I got to know him. 
I get to do some work in his memory in Belgrade. And United, as a football club, are greatly diminished by not having him alongside us anymore, in my humble opinion. Yeah, that was beautiful. Thank you for that, Patrick. Um, obviously, we'll come back and we'll talk some more as well in a minute about about um, Harry. You've you've also kind enough as well. Um, I mentioned this the other day when it comes to these shows. Patrick and the MMMF play a massive part in putting these shows together and planning them as well. And um, Patrick's put some fantastic bits and pieces for us to go through um, when talking about Harry in, in just a moment's time. But as always, at the start of these shows, um, I mentioned it earlier on. We've got authors and historians on with us today. Tom Clare has rejoined us. You would have seen him, of course, uh, on our last show when we spoke about Tommy Taylor and also Roy Kavanaugh as well has been on for not just uh, this one and the Tommy Taylor one but also the brilliant one about Duncan Edwards too. Roy I'll come over to you first it's great to have you back and um, I heard a snippet of you chatting off camera to Tom a little bit about the importance of that shirt and why you're wearing that tonight but also I want to ask you the question of when I mentioned the name Harry Gregg what memory or memories first come back to your mind? Yeah, well, as a, as a young lad, I always had two ambitions. One was to play goalkeeper for United or open the bat in for Lancashire Cricket Club. And I was never good enough to do either. Uh, and I just loved the goalkeeper's shirts. And I made it in the business. Um, it was a special offer on to get this uh, replica shirt of the 58 Cup final with Harry's signature on it and the, um, the bad job, whether it's a Phoenix or something else. Um and I thought tonight, instead of it hanging up with all the other memorabilia, actually to put it on. Um, but, but Harry Gregg, as uh, Pat so eloquently mentioned there, um, he, he was big, he was strong, he was brave. That was on and off the pitch. He was charismatic. Uh, he was a truly great goalkeeper. Far, far too brave on the pitch for his own good. And as he showed in Munich, far, far too brave at times off the pitch as well. Um, the word legend was just made for him. But as we, we, we mentioned last week and also when we talked about Duncan, we're going to have to think of other words because people these days, like you say, uh, get words, the legend mentioned after him. But this fella genuinely deserved it. I, I once wrote one of my books was about all the goalkeepers who'd ever played for Manchester United. But I did a speciality on them of those that won a medal, won a, a cup or won a league. And Harry didn't make that 11, but he made my book because of all the goalkeepers. He's, as, as I say, he was the most brave, most charismatic and a genuinely world class. He didn't make the book um, on the medal part, he made it as the man um, because in 1963, he missed out on the final with an injury. In 65, he missed out on the league with an injury um, and he suffered one or two bad shoulder injuries in his time. But these words not available to, to really justify. This guy was an absolute top, top bloke on and off the pitch. Yeah, I mean, we've mentioned the um, the heroic thing that he'd done. Um, Pat Patrick, obviously, you hit on it as well. And I, I was reading in my research um, George Best's quote on him. And, of course, what, what I didn't know as well, reading back at all the stuff, is George Best used to scrub his boots. Uh, yeah. is, is something that's quite well known, that, um, that Georgie Best used to do that. And, uh, and, and George Best had said about him, bravery is one thing, but what Harry did was about more than bravery. It was about goodness. And I think that says a lot about him as a man. And we're going to come on and we're going to talk about that in just a second. But first of all, Tom, uh, for you as well, a bit like the question to Roy, how important um, it was is Harry to United's legacy, to the club that we see now? But also, what memories come to mind for you when you think back to watching Harry Gregg in his heyday? Well, well, first of all, there is no two ways about it. He is an integral part of Manchester United's history, uh, both on the field and off the field. Uh, he, he played such an important part, um, especially in those dark days after, after, after Munich. Here. And, and some, of, some of his performances immediately after the disaster, they, they were quite unbelievable. I mean, you take that first season after Munich, uh, not, not, not 12 months after it, 
people seem to forget that that patched up team finished runners up in the first division to Wolves. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of that was, was down to the performances of Harry Gregg in goal. But my, my first memories of Harry Gregg were, were, were of an international match. I think it was in November 1957, where Northern Ireland came to, uh, to Wembley uh, to play England. And, and Northern Ireland, they, they were no hopers. There were no two ways about it. They, they, they were no hopers. But this goalkeeper, this lad from Coleraine, who, who, who was playing in the third division north at the time for Doncaster Rovers, produced one of the most outstanding goalkeeping displays that, that people had ever seen. And he was mainly the reason why um, uh, that Northern Ireland won that day. They, they beat England 3-2. And I believe that was the performance that Matt Busby and Jimmy Murphy decided that they 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 needed at Greg in goal. Um, there was a situation where Ray Wood, bless his heart, he, a tremendous keeper in his own right, was Ray. Um, he he played in that '57 Cup final and he'd suffered a, a really bad injury after the infamous Matt Parland uh, assaulted him. But um, it seemed. As, as, it, as his confidence had gone. And, and, and as they, they got into that early part of 56, 50, uh, sorry, 57, 58 season, some of the results started to go against them and they started losing games by the odd goal, 4-3, 3-2, 2-1. Uh, and it, it just seemed, you know, that uh, there's something was, was missing. And then in early December, um, Busby and Murphy decided they were going to buy Harry Gregg, and, 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 and which they did. And then Peter Doherty, who was his mentor and his manager at, uh, at, at Doncaster, uh, you know, he, he gave his blessing to it. So they paid a world record fee for a world-class goalkeeper. And, and, and Jimmy Murphy uh, told me once, he said, we classed him as a continental goalkeeper. And and he said he said we needed that at that time, and and he came he came to Manchester United mid December nineteen fifty seven, and uh, his opening game was against Leicester Leicester City on the twenty first of December. But what was surprising was that the number of changes that Matt Busby made that day to the team. With the way the results had gone, people were expecting that it'd be the defenders that would, would suffer because of the goals conceded. But I can always remember being, being at that Stratford end uh, the day that Harry made... Uh, not Stratford end, at the scoreboard end, the day that uh, Harry made his debut against Leicester. And just before, when they announced the changes, they, they were gasped because out of the side... And we knew Harry was playing in place of Ray Wood, but out of the side went Johnny Berry, Liam Whelan and David Pegg. And in comes 17 years old uh, Kenny Morgans, 18 years old Bobby Charlton, and 20 years old uh, Albert Scanlon. And, uh, you know, it, 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 people were thinking, you know, well, it, it, maybe the, def- the, the defensive shape of the team, you know, uh, would have been the problem, but it wasn't. But anyway, there was that there was that day there, that Saturday. I always remember Harry coming out from the tunnel there, this big, broad Irishman with twine toes jogging towards the... Uh, the, the scoreboard end. And at that time, United used to have a little mascot. Um, used to have the number six on the back of his shirt. And before each game, he'd go around the players handing them chewing gum. And I always remember Harry jogging to the goal at the scoreboard end, throwing his cap in the back of the net, and then turning round. And the little boy was going towards him uh, to hand him this piece of chewing gum. And he stopped, he froze. And Roger Byrne, bless him, got hold of the young kid and he shouted to Harry, he said, Harry, Harry, come, you know. And he went over and he took that piece of chewing gum. And that's one of the, the great memories I, I have of Harry, you know. Can, can I ask you then, Tom, obviously it's a world record transfer fee at yeah. the time for a goalkeeper. Um, and also you're talking of him there as a very prestigious goalkeeper joining the club. And obviously that story there shows that the, the young lad was starstruck to see Harry Gregg in goal. So how how well, well I'll take it very well known, but I suppose more of, did United know they were actually signing a world-class goalkeeper when he joined the club? Did you know the exact type of player you was getting when Harry signed? Obviously. Obviously. It's like what Jimmy Murphy said. It was what they were wanting. I mean, they, they were wanting a domineering goalkeeper. It was already a star. Guy. Yeah. Well, a star, you could say that, but it, but it was that performance at Wembley which I think actually turned the key 
Yes, I think that, that, that that's yeah. the one. I think Roy will agree me with me on that. That yeah. that was that was the, that was the performance that Busby and Murphy said he's the guy we want between the sticks. And uh, because I mean, he was a big guy. Don't yeah. get me wrong; people forget this. And he, he had he had big hands. Um, he he was he was flamboyant. He, he was courageous, as Roy said. I mean, he, he feared nothing. He feared nothing yeah. and nobody. And and Duncan Edwards said after that first game there was a period early in the game where there was a cross thrown in and Harry came out and Edwards was going for it and Harry knocked him completely out of the way and mm. took the ball and Duncan was on the floor and as he got up he said keep coming Harry keep coming mm. you know I mean this this was, this <laughs> was what they what they wanted you know uh, and and he, he, his agility was I mean that was another thing with Harry his agility was unbelievable mm. and some of the saves when you stood behind that goal and you studied him, some of some of the saves he pulled off, you wondered where it had come from. But I mean, yeah. he was so he was like a piece of elastic at times. Yeah. But it, the other the other side that I that I saw with him as well, he he knew he knew when to collect the ball and he knew when to punch the ball. And when he punched the ball, he punched it. You know, and I mean, he he, he, he was a commanding goalkeeper. Yeah. I I just jump in there. In answer to Tom's point there, which is all relative and, and correct, I agree, I agree that the Northern Ireland game was the first time I actually saw him. Uh, and England were on a great winning run, and Roger yeah. Byrne, Duncan Edwards and Tommy Taylor played for England that day. And Ireland didn't have a chance. It was 4-5-0, should have been, and Ireland won 3-2. And Greg was absolutely mesmeric. But what I did find only about three months ago for some bizarre reason, I was researching uh, a goalkeeper who certainly Tom will remember, uh, a very, very famous amateur goalkeeper called Mike Pinner. Yeah. Who actually played for United for four games in the in the 60s when Harry had one of his bad I'm shoulder sure. wounds. Yeah. Right, I'm researching this, this guy, and I'll explain after why, but I'm researching it. And on the 14th of December, 1957, Harry Gregg, was due to sign for Sheffield Wednesday. Yeah. Mm. And something had gone wrong. Uh, evidently, Doncaster were in then 18,000, and Sheffield was only wanting to pay 15,000. And they were in a panic because they were playing on, on the 14th, and they thought they were going to get Harry, but Harry was playing his last game for Doncaster. So they signed Mike Pinner, who was a, an amateur, uh, and Pinner played in that game. A couple of days after, United moved and the transfer had gone to 23,500, by the way. <laughs> so it just shows you. And those figures sound nothing today, but if you cool. resonate what the difference is in 23,000 in 1958 and the millions that that will be in um, today, so 2020. Um, and, and, and Tom, again, I didn't go to the Leicester game, but his next, because that was the 21st of... Yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. This next game was also home, and it was the last time that Manchester United or anyone played a game on Christmas Day. Luton. United played Luton Town, and I went to the game when my dad was nine. What a bird, what a Christmas present! Yeah, and you yeah. won three none. I think Edwards got a penalty, yeah. uh, and it was about forty thousand there. And we walked from our house in in Odsall over Trafford Bridge to the game. And then after the game, we went to visit an aunt um, where my mum had gone, who was on Great Stone Road in Stretford, and we walked it then down Chester Road. But that was a lovely Christmas present for a nine-year-old. Yeah, I, I, I was at both games, Roy. You know, yeah. but can yeah. can you can you? Uh, I mean, he, he, he was just such an icon of a player. And yeah. one of the things I remember when he first came, and especially Roy, that, that, that first derby he played, I think it was on New Year's Eve. Um, yeah. when he played at Main Road. He had a habit when the play was upfield of coming out of his goal and wandering around the eight between the 18-yard box and the centre yeah. circle. Yeah, it cost him a it hell of a lot of track. Yeah, it cost him sometimes, didn't it? Red Star, uh, yeah. one of the goals at Old Trafford, their goal. Yeah. Man, That's it was right, but it cost, cost him in the derby as well. And yeah, he, 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 got, he got some absolutely fearful stick from the press yeah. for it. Yeah. But, but again, uh, there, there were other times when balls were played over the top and he was first to it. 
Mm. Whereas today they would be saying, you know, that's the modern keeper, the you know, the the, the sweeper type keeper and keeper and everything. But mm. it, again, a, a different era, a different time. But but that's how he was. He was flamboyant, you know, and and, mm. that, and that was the way he played. And and you know, Busby and Murphy, I don't I don't think they really took him to task over it. You know, no, I've not counted, but they had lost one or two games, as Tom said, and that's why Matt. Um, reacted on Jimmy, but from the Leicester games, they actually were undefeated all the oh. way through January. Obviously, um, February, even the game uh, away at Red Star, and then at home she Sheffield Wednesday, then at home to Notts Forest, then away at West Brom, uh, and then they beat West Brom. So they were actually undefeated from about December the 14th to about March the 10th, something like that. And I have made a, a massive, massive difference, which of course all got shattered with with, uh, with what happened on February the sixth. Yeah, he, um, but he sounded. He, play, he it, played in, in some in, in some terrific games. It, I, I think I, it, if if my memory is correct, I think he only played eleven games with with the actual Busby Babes, but well, some yeah. of those games were terrific. And one and Royal remember this one. What I will always remember, our nemesis at that time, and has been even since then, Wanderers. They yes. always seem to stick it to us for some reason. But just a few weeks before they went to Belgrade, they played Wanderers at Old Trafford, and they absolutely battered them 7-2. Yeah. And I think that, that was a game where I saw a goalkeeper actually move to keep out of the way of a penalty kick. Yeah, Duncan. At the, at the, yeah. Was it his, you know, yeah. a little Eddie Hopkinson? That's right, and who I got to know very well later. He was a right oh, man, yeah. was it, with Eddie? Um, yeah. And then he, he would never admit to that, but I remember being behind the goal that day, and he moved very, very early. And I mean, that, that, <laughs> it, it was hit with such power, you know. But, but, but seven, oh, Tom, seven Tom, two. Tom, we, we know if we know if Harry was in that goal, it was saved. Yeah. We know if Harry was in the net that, for that penalty, yeah. it was safe. That's that's yeah. the difference. That's the quality he of class. He was fearless. You know, he, he I just, that, that that team, that young team. Don't forget they brought in. Yeah, you know, course. as I say, Morgan's, um, yeah. Charlton, Bobby Charlton was only a reserve at that time. Don't forget, yeah. this was just his breaking into the first team. Um, I want to. I definitely want to hit on some characteristics that I feel right. like I've got from you with the stories you're telling. But I just want to quickly, because we've heard there about a few of the games and the type of player he was. Pal, I want to come over to you because we spoke a little bit. Obviously, when we talk about uh, historic players and legends of the club, statistics always come up. Trophies won always come up. But when it comes to the statistics, Harry Gregg, and, and obviously when it comes to the lack of trophies, it's it's hard to talk about Harry from that point of view, isn't it? So I was wondering if you could just give us an oversight of of why the, so to speak, the lack of trophies, and also maybe some statistics that you can hit on, which emphasise a little bit more of the iconic goalkeeper and the fantastic goalkeeper that he was. He, um, he, 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 go on, Roy. No, no, I think it's sorry, Matt, Patrick, 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 Patrick. Sorry, Patrick. Sorry. So, in his time with us, which was fifty-seven to sixty-six. Late 57 to early 66, 270 odd games, just short of 50 clean sheets, runners up in the FA Cup 58, League 59. Well, we were talking about it before we came on air, Ben, and it's, uh, I think it was one of the the problems of a goalkeeper's trade. You know, they were, they were cannon fodder sometimes. Keepers were being injured left, right and centre. And at the very point where you're putting your body on the line in terms of its extremities, you're getting smashed by 14, 15 stone centre forwards. He took an awful lot of battering. And as a result, he missed out on, on the opportunity to get some of those honours, which he quite rightly deserved. I mean, if you think about it, he's, he's, he's joined the greatest club in the world. Less than three months later, he's surviving a plane crash pulling his teammates out he comes back to England not by plane he comes over land with Jimmy Murphy and Billy Fowkes because he wouldn't fly again and within four, 13 days he's playing football for his for his new football club and, and a team is scratched together and that team gets to the FA Cup final it's, it's unbelievable but more than that he then goes and represents a little, 
a little country in the World Cup finals in 1958. And he's classed as the greatest goalkeeper in the tournament and makes the World Cup team of 58. And we've yeah. spoke about we spoke about how brilliant Brazil were. We spoke about how England would have really challenged them for that with with the likes of Charlton and Violet and Edwards and Byrne in the team and Taylor. But he's the greatest goalkeeper. So he's, he's, he's you know, he's signed for a world record fee and he, and he proves himself at the World Cup finals for me in 1958. That's his greatest accolade after mm. everything that man has been through to be classed as the greatest goalkeeper in the world at the World Cup. Mm. It's, it's mm -hmm. unparalleled for me. I mean, yeah, there's been great goalkeepers with great statistics and great longevity of careers. But they didn't they didn't go through what he went through in that frame of in that in that time scale. Um, yeah. You know, we, we we talked about the 1957 FA Cup final. I think it might have been on the last show where Jackie Blanchflower had to go in net and the challenge that Ray Wood got from McParland. And you think about Bert Troutman breaking his neck. You know, Harry took some some terrible smacks. You know, broken shoulder, dislocated shoulder. Um, it was a different game, wasn't it, Pat, than it is today? Completely different game. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, when I, when I was a young man, I played Gaelic football, so I know a little bit about getting smacked and having your shoulder put out. And it's damn painful. But that man came back and back and back. So, yes, statistics, I get that that's really important to, to today's, you know, really tuned in modern fan who, who looks at all that, analyses it and makes judgments. But there's more to it than that. There's 100%. character, there's heart, there's guts, there's spirit. And mm -hmm. from what he went through in February, to be classed as the greatest goalkeeper at the World Cup in the June, for me, is unparalleled. I don't know what I don't know what the guys, Roy and Tom, think about that. Well, yeah, sorry, Tom, do you want to go? Because you were you was going to say yeah, something off the back yeah, of my questions. Just, just to, re to go back to what Pat's saying, two of those games in, in that World Cup, he played with a bad ankle injury. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and uh, in in one game they they actually strapped the boot to to his you know outside outside of, of the foot, and and I mean his performances in that World Cup were incredible. They they really were, and and that's why. And you've got to remember there were some great goalkeepers around there, and especially from the continent: Biara from Yugoslavia, Grosic from Hungary, um, Yashin from Ru from Russia. You know, mm -hmm. you're talking about real world class goalkeepers, and Harry was voted the best keeper in the world at that tournament. But mm -hmm. going back to what Pat was saying about about the physical side of the game, Harry was no Lily White. I'll tell you that now. Harry could look after himself. And there's many a time you would be watching the game and there was a few big centre-forwards who thought they could take liberties with them and then you'd suddenly see somebody lying face down in the turf and nobody saw what happened. And, and Harry, believe me, Harry, did Royal tell you, Harry, Harry, Harry would, you know, he, he could look after himself, put it that way. I'll tell you a you story. You though, right? Yeah. I'll tell you a story which uh, Tom will definitely have been at this game and it was the game when Tottenham Hotspur won the yeah. League and Cup double the year they won the League and Cup double and he came to United on a Monday night in 61 it, it should have been played on a Saturday but the Fogs came the game got called off Tottenham went home and he came back on the Monday night and I'll never forget it for, for two reasons and one of them is Harry Gregg the first reason was um, packed out at Old Trafford, 60 odd thousand there. And my dad had always told me to get me, me back to the, uh, the, the the crash barrier. And one of my mates behind was a, a little smaller lad, about 20 past seven. I said, Oh, come on, you know, you, you come in front of me. He come, and I, I'm on the on the barrier then. I think it was Nobby Style scored at mm -hmm. the strip then after about That's 20 right. minutes. And uh, oh, and they all come down, and I'm, I'm boom. Was and I genuinely don't remember except seeing myself being lifted over heads down to where the St. Anne's uh, ambulance men were behind the goal. Uh, and he brought me round. I'm only what 13 or so. Brought me down and he, he said, You want to go back? And I turned around and there's this sea of faces like this. Whoa, no, stop here. In that game, <laughs> Harry, got, Harry got one of his bad shoulder injuries. Yeah. Um, and he had to he had to go off to get it set. 
And Alec Dawson was in goal. So we won up against a team that's going to be un win the, the Cup and League. We won up, but we're down to 10 men. Harry then comes back, and I'm pretty sure he's, he, he was, his shoulder was, was strapped up. And he well, was, yeah. He went centre forward. And I'm sure he made the second goal for Matt Pearson. He did do. No he did way. Do. He did. I, I, I'll tell you, I, I would just see, I, I, I was fortunate enough, and we'll go back to this later, to, to be with Harry just before Christmas. He told me over that game, you know, and, and he, he did the shoulder injury diving at Bobby Smith's feet. Yeah. And, and, he, and he, he took the shoulder out. And, he, and Roy is correct. He came back and it was plastered across his, his, his thing there. And, and he just went up front and played on. He played yeah. at centre forward. And I'll tell you something else. He gave Bobby <laughs> Charlton a tongue lashing in that game. Because <laughs> it, it, he was making runs. He was going into space and he wasn't getting the ball. <laughs> and and he, he he really leathered Bobby Charlton about it. But but then I think, Roy, there was only a few minutes to go. And he, Harry had gone out to the right and he got yeah. this ball and he, 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 Charlton it was, Charlton was out on the right and he played that ball in and Harry was there in the centre forward position and he let it come through his legs and he just gave it a little flick and Colin Webster come in behind him and pushed it into the net oh, to win the game 2-0. Yeah. He's also got an assist role, to his name as well. So for the yeah. statisticians out there, he's got an assist <laughs> from in the, other team, in the opposition's box. I don't think many goalkeepers have got one of those. But, but, but in that game again, and, and, and Eero, you will remember, little Nobby, bless his heart and soul, yeah. he's playing yeah. against Danny Blanchflower for the first time. Yes. And and in the first few minutes, there's a ball goes between them. Now he there's 19, 20 year old <laughs> Nobby, and, and this, you know, this, this world class ring half and captain of Spurs. Yeah, Nobby hit him in a tackle that was perfectly fair. Are you sure, and, and it, it was fair. I'll tell you, he, he hit he hit the ball. He hit Blanche. Yeah, yeah, but but Tom, Tom, are you sure it was? I fair? am ninety nine percent positive because Nobby Nobby told me. <laughs> he, <laughs> but he he Blanche Flower went up in the air like a rag doll, and he, yeah. he came down, hit the turf, and he he wasn't in the game for a lot after that, and he. he he never liked Nobby after that. He used to call him a dirty so and so, you know. Yeah. But but yeah. Nobby always smiled. He said, Yeah, because he had no heart, you know. But but that was my another memory of that game. But Harry Harry was the the, the, the guy who, who actually killed the game off in that final few minutes. I love that. Yeah. I love that. The more the more I hear you guys talking about him and his on field presence, the more I get and, and Patrick, I'm gonna come back over to you here because it's off of some reflects off of something you said in the first place, actually, this point. He does come across as a as a leader, and of course, the the role he played after Munich building Manchester United back up with the likes of of Bobby, Jimmy, Bill. I mean, it doesn't go. I mean, you can you can read it in the history books. You can go and check it out. Doesn't get talked about an awful lot, does it? So, can you shed some light on on the role Harry Gregg played in in the rebuilding of Manchester United Football Club after after, of course, the air disaster? Well, I wasn't I wasn't there, so I, I mean, I, I have read about it. These, these these two guys were there, but I've spoke I've spoke to to Harry about it, and and, and he saw it as pretty much like Bobby and Bill that it was uh, mission unaccomplished and, you know, they, they, they lost friends and, and they knew that they had to rally and champion the cause and follow Jimmy Murphy under the flag and make sure, because we spoke about this in the Jimmy Murphy show, didn't we, in terms of, you know, the board... They were quite prepared to say, right, that's it. And it was Jimmy Murphy who said no. Um, and when you've got people like Harry and Bobby and Billy Fouch and then other players that they brought in with the characters that they had, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure they'd be the glue that helped Jimmy stick it all together and help Matt stick it all together again and start, you know, the new generation process that brought us to Wembley 68. Yeah, I think I think in fairness to Harold Hardman, who, who I've just finished in writing the book, uh, A Man of Football, uh, be out before Christmas, about Harold's life. And he was the chairman at, at that time. And, you know, there's no doubt Jimmy Murphy, no doubt Jimmy Murphy saved Manchester United. 
I, I think, though, mm. that um, when you read be, between the lines, the directors, um, there, there was Harold as a, a frail guy then, that was, what, 1958? He was, uh, he'd be 70-odd then, 75, 76 then. Um, and one of the directors had, got, had died the week before Munich, uh, the night before the Arsenal game. Um, so there was only about two, three directors. Alan Gibson was one. Um, Bill Petheridge. Uh, Bill Petheridge, brilliant, yeah. And they, they brought Edwards in. They wanted to bring Satanath, it's Satanath in, but they brought Edwards in because only Willie, Willie Satanath got killed at Munich. But the pressures, they off the field as well, Pat. Um, I mean, they, they weren't insured. I mean, I know it sounds daft now, but they, why would you insure anybody for... Um, you know, for an air crash at, 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 in that stage. Um, and they had to play games and they had to put 22 players out at first and second team, else Ardacre would have thrown the, the book at them. Um, so there must have been a heck of a lot of pressures off the field. And and, and Ardman, I'm sure as well, in his a different way, was as uh, influential off it. But going back, to the, going back to the big man, and we just spoke about the Tottenham game there, um, I think he'd hurt his shoulder actually um, about ooh, about six months before at, at Sheffield Wednesday. I remember watching a the game there, and he died on a hard ground, and he, his shoulder hurt. But then, of course, he he did uh, his shoulder again. Uh, sorry, he got hurt against um, Liverpool when Ronnie Yates came up for a corner uh, and and clattered him. And uh, I'm not sure if it was his jaw or something uh, he did. But of course, Harry um, played in all the games. Uh, in the 63 Cup, he played in the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth round, then got an injury, missed the semi final. Yeah. And I think he came back for three or four games just before the final and, and, and actually was fit. And, and Matt went with uh, Dave Gaskell, uh, which, you know, it, it, was, it was perhaps a surprise. It was a surprise to me because a fit Harry would be in your side um, at any time. Well, an unfit Harry would be in my side any time, to be honest. Um, yeah. But that cost him a, a cup winner's medal. And then he, he had that injury against Liverpool. Uh, and, and the following year, 65 season, sorry, 64 five season, um, the, him, him and Gaskell, he was injured and Gaskell wasn't playing so well. And they brought this, this big other big Irish lad called Pat Dunn in. And, you know, Pat, likeable lad. And I was at Everton when he made his debut in a 3-3 draw. And he went on this massive undefeated run and won the league title, and Harry couldn't get into the side. Um, you know, so he missed an FA Cup winner's medal. He also missed how many medals back in 1958? I'm not sure we'd have won the league, but we, we had a chance against War. I'm pretty sure we'd have won the FA Cup, and I'm yeah. pretty sure we'd have gone a damn way of winning the European yeah. Cup in 58. So, I, you know... I agree, Roy. The trophy yeah, how important, Tom, was... How, how important for you, Tom, was Harry Gregg in the rebuilding of, of the football club? He, he was massively important, but he, he was very unlucky. And, and and it's sad to say, Harry's life was tinged with tragedy because mm. 1961, he lost his wife. His wife died from cancer and left him to bring up two young girls. Yeah. You, you know, so as well as his injuries, he had that personal grief to put up with. The pressures of playing for Manchester United in, in, in a rebuilding uh, era as well, you know. So he, 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 you could say he was grossly unlucky. I mean, Roy Roy's perfectly correct. I mean, Harry personally told me last December he was so pissed off with Busby when he didn't play in the in the sixty three yeah. cup final. He, yeah. he, he was, and there is some footage on YouTube of inside the dressing room after the game. Have a look at Harry. It's as though it's, he, did, he didn't want to be there. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know. and, and it, it was said that Nobby Styles was the same. He'd played in every round up to the, up yeah. to including the semi final and yeah. got left out of the final. Yeah. You know, he loved playing football, didn't he, Harry Gregg? That's what oh, I'm getting from both of you. He absolutely well, loved being on that football pitch and competing well, he, to he, win he said, games. He, he, said, he said immediately after Munich, he said, you know, he said, I've just come to Hollywood. He said, here I was coming out of the third division. He said, I, I finally made it to Hollywood, you know. He said, and then after the, uh, after the accident, he said, the only thing that kept me sane, he said, was getting back out there on the pitch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, he, he, 
it was they, they, if, if you ever look at that, you look at Bill folks, you look at um, Harry, and you, you you look at Bobby Charlton. Their performances immediately after Munich were unbelievable for what they'd yeah. gone through. The, you know, a, the, there's a lovely saying of Harry's, but I think it might have been the first time um, that he went back to Munich um, to the airport. Um, obviously, later on, and and he and he said. He, he looked around and he looked at the um, the buildings and he said, the last time the, the, the Busby Babes and the team walked out of this um, airport terminal, they walked out as a as a football club. From an hour later, they became an absolute institution and a legend. Yeah. The, the whole name of Manchester United was, was different after that uh, air crash. Right. And, Go on, mate. No, no, and, and it can't be over overstated, Ben. What the two guys have said that those fourteen, you know, they only won one league game uh, in after the Munich crash in that season. They only won one league game, but they got to the cup final, and of course, they were in the semi final of the European Cup. But what they did do, they absolutely stabilised Manchester United, and those certainly Harry and Billy uh, and Bobby a, a bit later, but those two. You know, you can't take any other. It, they kept them on a pedestal. And the year mm. after, incredibly be, became runners-up. Um, I always thought about fate. The year after the crash, around February the 6th, they actually played Wolverhampton Wanderers at Old Trafford, who they should have played on February the 8th. You know, the game after Munich, they should have played Wolves at the top of the table. And when they beat Wolves on in February 1959... They beat them 2-1. They were actually in a higher league position than they were in 1958 before the crash. They were second. Mm -hmm. because I think in 58, they were third or fourth, you know, around the Munich time. Um, but Harry's influence on the whole club, and I think it's fair to say that anybody who knows anything about history to do with Manchester United. And I don't mean they need to be as old as Tom and myself. Anybody, uh, 50s, 60s, even a 20-year-old, even a 10-year-old who learns the history of Manchester United, no one's going to go higher than what Harry Gregg did. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, his legend is there to see for anybody. Yeah. And Indeed. that's what I love about doing this show. We learn a bit more about that. We learn a bit more about him as a player, which maybe you can't tell within clips. Sometimes you've got to watch full games and we're lucky to be joined by yourself, yeah. Roy, and yourself, Tom, to be able to talk about him because already I've learned about his athleticism. I've learned yeah. about how he commands the area. Little things he used to do in games that you were saying there, coming out of his box and standing between his, his box and the halfway line. You know, his passion, leadership, his characteristics, his footballing IQ, by the way, as well, in terms of what you guys are saying, and he knew when to come and punch a ball. He knew when to, to come out of his box and kick it to clear it. He he knew how to read a game of football as well. And he was tough as nails, tough yeah, as old man. nails as well, listening to you guys. And that's the footballer. That, that's that's the footballer. That's the goalkeeper, Harry Gregg. Mm. But I, I want to also learn a little bit about about the man and 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 you know Tom obviously you you said you've been lucky to spend some time with him, but Patrick I I know full well that, that obviously you, you know his family you 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 know Harry um and and you've had some great great stories and you've told me obviously in confidence some great stories of some time you spent with Harry with look at a smile on your face straight away the memories come flooding back and and, and the smile says it all so I just I want to ask you a bit more about Harry Gregg as, as a man you know maybe back in football in heyday but also after his his time as a footballer, when he went into management and 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 there on after as well. Well, I was I was really lucky. Uh, a good friend of mine, Tony O'Neill, he knew Harry very very well, and the family Carolyn, uh, particularly Jane, son-in-law Keith. And after we did arranged and delivered the 60th anniversary in Munich. Tony had this great idea. What Because we lay a wreath every year. Why don't we bring the ribbons back with us and start to give them to people associated with the tragedy? And that was a great idea. And, and we do it. And we do it every year. But the first recipient had to be Harry Gregg. So we managed to get these frame set of ribbons 
So they were laundered, put into a frame. We managed to get them to Northern Ireland and the family knew we were coming and why we were coming, but Harry didn't. And when he heard Tony was coming and bringing three of his mates, he said, oh, uh, don't have them stopping in a guest house. They can come and stop here. So we, we got to stay with him for two days. And it was like the other two guys... Tony Crook, who was the vice chairman of the MMMF, and Martin McVarnock. And it was like all your Christmases had come early. You actually just be in his presence. And he had, he had a pretty, he had a pretty um, strict regime in terms of, you know, he, he's, he's, he's well into his 80s, um, you know, needs lots of rest. Um, and he broke all his habits because he spoke to us non-stop about football. That's all he wanted to talk about was football. And he was not only knowledgeable and a fantastic memory, and I'm sure he won't mind me saying he was very, very, very cute. Does he test your knowledge? And I can see Tom laughing, because I know he did it with Tom as well. He did. Test your knowledge about what you knew. <laughs> and we were throwing all sorts of names out at him. What did he think of so and so? Oh, what was it like with O'Farrell? What was it like with uh, with Sexton when you came back? And how come Atkinson got rid of you? And you know what was it like with Wilf McGuinness and Sir Matt? And he was, he's giving us all these stories. Now we never for one minute thought he would talk to us about that fateful day, and we never asked him, but he did. So I know firsthand what he went through on that day. But his knowledge and his passion for football, I'll give, I'll give you a nice little story. He said, Martin said to him, hey, Harry, what do you reckon to Brian Clough then? And he, and he went off on this, uh, this, this resume of what he thought about Clough and he absolutely loved Cloughy. Martin, Martin told him a story about how he'd managed to get into Brian Clough's office when United were playing Forest one day. He got in early and he was going through Brian Clough's office and he found a bottle of whiskey and he started to have a drink and Clough came in. And Harry thought that was bloody hilarious. So he's telling us all about Clough and what a great manager he was and how the FA did him wrong and he should have never been treated the way he was and he wished he'd worked with him. And he's a real man's man. And, and he, he doesn't suffer fools and he don't take prisoners. So you can imagine with, with us as well, there's going to be the occasional choice word thrown in. So it, it's going on the banter and we're, and we're sat in his front room. And all of a sudden, I just look at him and I went, now listen to me, young Mr. Greg, I'm not having you using that sort of language in my dressing room now. Get out of my house. And he just roared laughing. The tears are streaming down his face. And we actually went to present him with the ribbons and he didn't know. So we snuck him into the house, sat him behind the settee where he was sat. And at an appropriate point, we'd been out for a cup of tea and a cigarette, come back in. And I did this presentation to him. And he started crying. And we started crying. And he, he said, and, and there is there's an article on our website about, about the whole the whole presentation of the ribbons. I can't, I can't be verbatim, but he said, I can't believe that United fans still think of me, this old man, after all these years, I'm just lost for words. And that was a mark of a man. And, you know, they, they went up a pride of place. He had, a, he had a, a, a beautiful study, which was just completely full of wonderful photographs and memories from his life right right throughout his career. Tom, Tom knows because he's been in the same room. It, it was just it was just incredible. It was like if you were a lover of art, it was like being in some billionaire's, you know, multi multi-art collection. You were just surrounded by the greats of world football and Harry Gregg's in every one of them. And he's there going through telling you about, you know, this is such and such and this is such and such. I think I said at the start, you know, meeting your meeting your idols can be fatal sometimes. But, yeah. you know, I know all four of us, to the day we die, will carry that with us as, as being one of the greatest memories I will ever have of just being able to be with him. Um, yeah, he was just um, a lovely, lovely, lovely man. 
what you said there oh, about he's, 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 his routine went to cock he should have been he should have been in bed 11 o'clock at night we're putting him up to bed at one in the morning and we're not drinking me, me and Tony don't drink Harry doesn't drink we're just making cups of tea and talking football so we get up the next morning and we go downstairs and we go out for a cigarette and come in and, and Carolyn's like, this is his wife. Is, is he all right? Did he go to bed? Yeah, he was, he, was in, he was in bed by like half 11. He was all right. She says, oh, we, we, won't, we won't see you until maybe sort of mid-morning. And uh, she's making us cups of tea and we're all sat around the breakfast table and she's starting to put the eggs and bacon and sausages on for us. And then you hear this noise upstairs. And she's like looking at us and she's going, surely to God, that, that's not Harry. And, and it was, he got up to come down and he comes down the stairs. And this is how funny this man is. He opens the door to his own kitchen, puts his head in and says in his broadest accent, and pardon my language, what are you four fucking hooligans doing in my house? Get out. <laughs> <laughs> and then comes bellowing in sits down, asks what's for breakfast and sits there and has, has his cup of tea and he's, he's, he's fry up with us. Just beautiful, beautiful memories of a, of a lovely, lovely man who just wanted to be remembered for being a footballer. That's, that's what I would yeah. love to be able to say about him. Would, would he be, is, is he the type of person who would hate us talking about him now like we are instead of talking about what he done on, on the pitch? Because he very much comes across that way. Yeah. Tom, uh, let me come over to you. Yeah, he, he, he never, Harry was never one for self adulation or, or publicity or anything like that. Similar to uh, what Pat just said, I, I was very, very fortunate in all the years that I followed Manchester United. One of my big big regrets was that I never, ever got to meet Harry Gregg. And then when I was over in, in Manchester in December last year, Mark O'Connor and the family made it possible for me to go over to Northern Ireland, to Coleraine, uh, and, and to go to, and, and meet him. And um, I always remember the Saturday uh, when I went to the, the, the house there and Harry was sat there in his chair by the window and Caroline said, you know, go in. And she said to the other, stay here, just let them have time together. And, and I walked in and I said, Mr. Greg. And he just looked at me. He said, call me Mr. Greg again. He said, and you go out through the front door. You know? <laughs> and, and we sat down and I had, in fact, we actually later on watched the Manchester Derby in, in December together. But I had four hours with him that Saturday night. Um, it, it was the most incredible time that I, I, I can ever, ever, you know, remember. I mean, it, it meant so much. And, and we went through so many different things. Uh, I was able to, to sort of pluck his memory, you know, and, and pick the back pocket of his memory. Uh, and, and his face would light up and everything. But like Pat said, he was no fool. He would test you to see that you weren't BSing him, you know. Mm -hmm. And he, he would throw a question in and you'd know where it come from. Uh, and and he he would he would go through stories and and you know I mean people wouldn't believe there's so much happened at Old Trafford. I mean he told me about the thief in the dressing room, the mm. time the time when they were going to throw games, you mm. know, uh, a lot of big big stories about about that time about different players, you know, mm. and uh, you know what it, what his feelings were about Jimmy Murphy and some that you know. It, it, they they, they they were stories and, and memories that are locked away in my heart. And and then it, the, the saddest part was, was talking to him, like Pat said, about Munich and was listening to him in his own words mm -hmm. and how his memory, you know, recalled it all. And we both sat there with tears streaming down our face. And he kept reciting the poem he, 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 he wrote, you know, about Munich, which, which is a wonderful piece of work. And um, we said our goodbyes that night, you know, and I, I was so, so chuffed and I thanked Caroline and uh, off we went. And then the following day, we, we were over at the Giants Causeway and um, we, the weather was bad and everything. And we decided to go for lunch at the um, at the the golf club there where the open was held last year, and we sat having lunch. And Mark O'Connor's phone went, and he answered. And he said, "Oh, Tommy said it's for you." So you know, I'm thinking, 
for me. So anyway, the next thing was, I said, hello, he said, Mr. Clare, he said, I need somebody to talk to. Get your ass over here. <laughs> and it was, it was Harry. So that. we finished lunch and we went over there and I had another five hours with him. Wow. You know, five hours talking about past times, past games, managers, players, the game today, you know, uh, how United are today. It, it, it was just it, it, just an incredible, incredible time. And I'm just so, so thankful that I I got that time with him because, you know, just yeah. eight weeks later, he'd gone. I remember, Tom, I, I know he brought um, Jim Holton. He got Jim Holton to United. I'm, I'm yeah. pretty sure. Yeah. He was a, did he have anything to do with coaching uh, Gary Bailey? I can't remember whether yes, he was. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He did. He, 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 he did. He did. You know. Uh, he, 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 he. I mean, there were so many things that he did. I mean, people don't realise he saved Nobby Styles' career. No, nobody realised that Nobby was had a problem with his eyes. Mm. Uh, right, uh, yes. Yeah. And then yeah. he went to Matt Busby. He said, "Hey, you need to get this fella to an optician." Yeah. He said he's mistiming everything. He said he's he's not seeing properly. And of course, when they went and they had him checked out, he ended up with the big, you know, the the big contact yeah. lenses. Yeah. Um, he, he was very influential, and, and and I mean, he had a love hate relationship with Johnny Giles. They they ooh, crumbs. He, in Italy, there was once he he chased Johnny Giles around the hotel. There, he was going to kill him. But what, um, what about but the other side of it was you could go to a game, stand behind the goal, and sometimes. You'd get some wag in the crowd from the opposition wanting to have a go at him, shouting and catch, and Harry would Harry would retort to him. And I'll tell you some <laughs> of it some of it was choice, believe me, you know. Not for air, not for air. We'll know, save that story. He, we do that for the watershed show. He, yeah. he you know, he, he would curse and, and you know, yeah, I'd be over there in five minutes, you know, if you think you're a man, he said we'll sort it out, you know. He, just a quick one. Was it was it true he had Albert Scanlon hanging out of a bedroom window? True. And he, he loved he, 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 lo he loved scanning as well. He did. Yeah, I know. He went over it and put him out and he had he had his feet yeah. in it when he was oh dear. Yeah, he uh, he, he absolutely loved Albert Scanlon and, 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 and God bless him. Albert, as we know, fell on hard times, and Harry yeah, looked yeah. after him. Between you and me, Harry, Harry looked after him. You know, yeah. you know. Yeah. But again, what Pat was saying about about Munich, you know, and and, and, and I went back there again in in February this year, and, and the old control tower is still there, and also is the old old passenger terminal that's still there, exactly as it was all those years ago. And standing on the steps that February morning this year, it it it, it, it was just unreal uncanny you know and, and, and all, all the ghosts come you know you, you walking in the shoes of, of, of the, you know the team that you adored sort of thing you know and uh, it for any, anybody and pat will bear me out here and, and, and Roy, anybody who can make that journey to munich as a manchester united fan needs to do it because i'll tell you you know they'll, they'll come back they'll come back so fulfilled by it that's the terminal, Harry said. Yeah. We walked out of there as a football club. That's right, yeah. Yeah. And after the crash, we were an institution. Yeah. It really um, is. He also, he also really wished is that is um, he, he also wished that at least one of them would have had the courage of their own convictions at the time to say yeah, I'm yeah. not going. Yeah. And if one yeah. had, they all that would that would have been it. Yeah, that that would have been. But you know, Pat, they they, they were they were feared by the the Hardacre thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, they were they were under threat because oh, Hardacre yeah. would have pulled the rug from underneath them, and and they had that yeah. important game against Wolves the following Saturday, which would have put them if United had won it, would have put them within three points. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, so so it, it 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 was. I mean, there were so many things with, with, with Munich. It has so many tentacles, you know. And oh, again, you go you going back to the rebuilding of the club. You, you, you know, it wasn't only the first team. They had to field the reserve team. They had to field an A and B team. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and it's like they said about Jimmy. Now, Harry absolutely idolised Jimmy Murphy. 
he really did. I mean, I talked to him about about Jimmy, you know, and uh, and his praise could not be higher, you know. And I mean, it, it's like we said. I always say that Samat was was the architect, but Jimmy was the engineer. Jimmy was the nuts and bolts man who put it all together. And without Jimmy, Matt could never have achieved what he did, you know. And and Harry, Harry was Harry was was great with this. But again, going back, I mean, so unlucky. Anybody who tells me that Pat Dunn was a better goalkeeper than Harry Gregg, well, I'll say you want you know, you, you want lots of nuts. <laughs> yeah. You want lots of nuts. You, you know, but, yeah. but again, because of the results, it, it was the yeah. old thing: don't change a winning team. Yeah, yeah, undefeated. Yeah. You know, and Pat Dunn, Pat Dunn only did that season and walked away with a, a first division yeah. championship medal. Yeah. and then of course, when again, a lot of people don't realise you get into nineteen sixty six. And we play Benfica in the quarterfinals of the European Cup. And now he's in goal. And there you go. The goalkeeper in that famous 5-1 game and in the one at Old Trafford, 3-2. Yeah. He played in all the European games. In fact, that was his, his last real full season at Old Trafford. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and, and he, 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 he said the partisan game. He said, he, he, he said, you know, that was the season when they should have won it. You know, well, he, he, what, what would the emotion just imagine that that when they played Partizan away in 66 yeah. the semi yeah. just beat Benfica 5 1. George was carrying a bad injury, which was unfortunate. But just imagine Billy Folks, Bobby Charlton, and Harry Gregg that afternoon well, walking cool. out at Partizan and it's the same yeah. pitch, same stadium. Played, yeah. same same stadium. stadium. Yeah. Oh, dear. Yeah. Can I um, just quickly, guys, make sure you like the video, share it about as well. Obviously, we're talking here about, about Harry Gregg and it would be fantastic to get this just across, as far across the fan base as we can, just to inspire generations to be able to read up more about Harry's story, uh, to learn more about the babes and to be able to go online and have a look at, at the, the, the true heroes of this football club. You know, the, the players who have made such a difference to to bring us the club that we've got today. That that's why we're doing these shows. So please please share it far and wide. I've got I've got one question for each of you just, just to wrap this this show up slightly. Um Roy, I want to come over to you. Obviously, I asked Pat and Tom and, and Tom and Pat, thank you so much for sharing such personal stories with us. Like we massively appreciate it. Hearing those stories, Roy, um it must be so heartwarming for you to, to sit there listening to those as it is for me. But I also just want to ask you what, you know, you, you listen to these stories and you've written a number of books and, and you know, you're, you're an author, you're also in, in a historian, but when, when you historian, sorry, but when you hear the name Harry Gregg, what, what do you, what do you love the most about ha Harry Gregg's character? What do you love the most about Harry Gregg's story? Because I know that's a question that we could sit here and talk about for days in terms of the hero that he's become and the person that he has become in terms of Mr. Manchester, Mr. Manchester United. But I suppose I just want to get a feel for you in terms of when you hear the name Harry Gregg, what, what the first, first thing, so to speak, comes to mind is. Well, the first thing is hero straight away. But he's, he's a man that any man, any man would have given his right, right arm to be a fraction as big a man as he was. He lived life to the full. Mm -hmm. He had tragedies in his personal life, like Tom mentioned. He had tragedies with his friends at, at Munich. And here's this big Irishman who was a magnificent goalkeeper, the best goalkeeper in the World Cup, only three or four months after he'd, he'd walked away from that plane that was burning away. Um, one of the greatest goalkeepers in the world, a man who's an absolute legend. And every time I think of Harry Gregg, I think of happiness in a way. And I know that sounds daft because we're just talking about sadness there, but he was so charismatic um, and a true hero. Um, and I envy the, the two guys because the times I met Harry, uh, I was much, much younger. And I envied these two guys meeting him in those last years. But a hero, that's how I remember him. Thank you, Roy. And, and Tom, similar question for you. If, if I had to ask you for, for a tribute to Harry and, and how you would best... You know, so to speak, if someone asked you asked you about him, what what would you say? Well, for me, my memories are, are, are Harry the man. 
You know, I mean, he, he was an incredible human being. Uh, he was as straight as a die. He told you as it was. He, he you know, he didn't suffer fools. He he was as honest as, as the day was long. Uh, but not only that, a great player, a great player who, who absolutely adored Manchester United uh, and, and was a great credit to them. Uh, he, he loved his country, you know, it, little on Northern Ireland and the performances he, he put in there. Uh, but he... He, he was just a super, super human being who who, who had a tough life it, it, from the from his early life, even through to his professional life. You know, he, he met tragedy head on, and uh, he dealt with it. You know, he, he, and and it, it's just incredible. You know that the that the man came through it as uh, 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 as he as he did, and I'll always remember saying goodbye to him. You know, in 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 Colrain last December, uh, and he put his arms around me, and he just said to me, he said, "You're always welcome back here," and that that meant so much to me. A wonderful, wonderful human being, and again, a credit to himself, uh, to his family, uh, to the Manchester United Football Club, and to Northern Ireland. Mm. I mean, Pat, and I. It'll be a hard, a hard one for you as well. But um, Harry, Greg, what would you like to say? Friend, hero, legend. Uh, a, a sign of a man is, is the legacy he leaves behind. And this is a man who is loved by thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Reds. His family adore him. He's left a legacy in Northern Ireland, the Harry Gregg Foundation, where regardless of your age, your colour, your sex, your creed, your physical ability, you can get out and play football and enjoy it. And I will never forget the people of Coleraine um, as they said goodbye to him. It was remarkable uh, to see that whole town turned out, clapping him through the streets. That's, you know, if you had a fraction of that after you went, then you know you've lived a good life. And uh, we're, we're blessed to have had him. A legend, an absolute legend of this football club, but more than that, a fantastic man. Um, we can only still send our, our love and our respects to his fantastic family and his friends. And as Pat said, the people of his hometown as, hometown as well. And of course, I want to point every single person who's watching this video to please go and find out more about Harry Gregg. Please go and find out more about the Busby Babes. Let's make their legacy live on. They are more than just footballers. They are heroes. And there's a number of ways you can do that. Please go and follow Tom. Tom can recommend you some fantastic books. Roy the same. Patrick the same. They can recommend how you can go and find out more about the people, and let's say it, people who set the foundations of our football club to make it what it is today because we wouldn't have the football club we have today without them. So please go and find out more about them. Please go and find out more information about the Harry Gregg Foundation. And if you can support, please go and support. We're going to put the links in the description as well and show our support to the Harry Gregg Foundation after this podcast too. So please go and check it out. And again, Thank you for watching. And and again, I've, I've mentioned it before, but I want to mention it again. Obviously, our respects and our love go out to Harry Gregg's family. And Harry, I think I speak on behalf of everyone here. And when I say the guys here are going to absolutely and do miss you, us as a football club, we're going to miss you. Us as fans, we're going to miss you. And we're going to continue your legacy. And I can promise you that. Pat, Tom, Roy. Thank you so much again. I've been sat here in awe listening to you guys with your stories. I'm going to push everyone to go and follow you and to, to mention and to come and chat to you after the show if they've got any more questions or they want to find out more about Harry Gregg and the Busby Babes. Guys, make sure you subscribe to All for United. Go and check out some more of our specials as well that we've done on Jimmy Murphy, Duncan Edwards and Tommy Taylor. And I'm sure we'll be back in the next international break, Pat, to chat about more icons of this football club uh from 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 for, to inspire a generation because that's why we do it so guys thank you for watching um, this has been a harry Gregg special Pleasure. guys thank you for coming yeah. on and uh and take care i think we're all feeling the emotion right yeah. now and i don't quite want to say bye yeah. but we're gonna say bye thank you everyone take care, take care. everybody great yeah. to speak to you <laughs>